everyone. Today we are going to talk about async challenges uh, in EF Core when we have large data set and we're going to just going through some uh, different diagrams to understand what is the problem exactly. Uh, my name is Saeed Ismail Najad. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP, currently working as a senior software engineer at Leeds Building Society. Usually I create some content on my personal blog, LinkedIn, YouTube. So if you would like, you can check my uh, profile uh, as well. So here is the agenda for today. We are uh, going to start with explaining the scenario, uh, what is exactly uh, happening uh, in the async APIs uh, in EF Core. Also, after that, we uh, are trying to uh, see the benchmark and the result to just get uh, more idea of what's going on. And after uh, we go through the what is the issue and where it comes from exactly. And for sure, we're going to talk about the, the solutions. And after applying those solutions, we're going to run the benchmark again and see the updated numbers. And we're going to have one uh, conclusion at the end. So let's go straight to the point. In EF Core, async operation is much slower than sync operation when we are dealing with the large data set. Apart from that, OK, everywhere, everyone saying that async operation is the best practice and everywhere we need to use it. That's correct, but not always. In such a, this kind of scenarios that we, got, we are going to talk about, async operation is not that good, right? And uh, so what is the reason to have the uh, large data set when we are saying that, OK, uh, what, what is that size that we are talking about is actually when we have a varchar max or var binary max in our database as a column type, <clears throat> we have we may have um, a size, a big size when we are trying to retrieve the data from database. And of course, in any case, maybe we're going to return, I don't know, millions rows from database. So obviously, we're going to have more uh, size in case of the megabyte or more. But here, I'm going to just focus on the uh, varchar max and see what's uh, going to happen. So what is the use cases when we are using the varchar max or var binary max? Some properties that we don't know about the length. Maybe we have a description property in, for example, user profile. But as a developer, I don't know user how much uh, text gonna put on this description. So I just said, let it be uh, varchar max and then let the user free to put everything, right? And then the storing file is another interesting scenario that I don't like it, to be honest. For the serving file, usually we are using kind of CDN or other uh, Azure Blob Storage or something like that, but still there is some uh, scenarios that maybe team decide to um, storing files into the database as a var binary max, or maybe convert the file to the base 64 and then save it as a string. Um, but I mean, maybe there is some use cases for having more security over the, when user wants to download the file you, you you're saying that okay okay i can authorize fully the the user and everything is secure but um for my opinion it's not a good idea uh but let, let's go for the the benchmark and uh, seeing the result so here is the the entities that i'm gonna uh show the benchmark on them I simply just created two tables uh, with two uh, properties, ID as a primary key, text as a, a string, which is will be the varchar max. So if we, <clears throat> we just uh, run the migration with the EF core, because we didn't put any constraint on the text, it will select the nvarchar max. This is the default behavior for the EF core. So nothing special here. And now let's. Uh, I, I want to show the the benchmark code as well. 
uh, what I'm talking about. So here is the benchmark using benchmark.net for the SQL server. And in this setup, uh, I delete everything on my tables and then just insert only one record, right? I have four methods as a, for running the benchmark. One is the async API, first or default, only top one, and then using the sync one. Nothing special, I just wanted to keep it very simple to run the benchmark. And here in DB context as well, I just have two DB sets and then setting connection string like this uh, one, because I want to use it for uh, one of the solution. And also I have the uh, benchmark for the Postgres as well, just to make a comparison between <clears throat> um, SQL Server and the Postgres for just getting better idea about the, the benchmark result. Everything is the same, entities, tables, the benchmark code, all the same, just different database provider, okay? So for sake of the time, I don't want to run the benchmark because it's uh, taking time, but I already have the result here and we are going to talk on uh, those numbers. Okay, this is the EF core, the latest version that Tuesday uh, released. And uh, here is the result for the SQL server, which is very surprising. As you can, you can see that async operation, um, first or default async actually, is taking more than one second, where the sync operation is only taking 25 milliseconds. Means it is around sync one 50 times faster than async one. And more importantly, this is the memory uh, allocation, which I uh, care more about it. Okay, performance, the speed of the query is matter, but the memory allocation here is more important for us as a backend developer. It is going to using lots of memory, lots of, I don't know, costs in your cloud uh, provider. So the memory allocation, as you can see, it's much more for the async one. But let's see the Postgres. Postgres is totally normal, actually. When we are Checking the numbers, even allocation part is the same, and uh, the the performance, the speed of the query, async one is slightly different, which making sense because when you are using the async uh, APIs, by default you are putting a little more uh, overhead on your runtime for checking the lots of events, state machine, everything. So. That makes sense. And we are accepting that uh, slightly changes for the using async, but seems the problem is only in the SQL server. So furthermore, we just going through the SQL server and find out what is the, the problem exactly. So let's ask this question. Is it really about the EF core that we had those benchmark and for the SQL Server provider can be the culprit, the EF core. We will see the exact point of the problem. So for understanding the, the big picture of this issue, first of all, we need to understand how EF core exactly executes a query, right? Because we need to get this idea how, uh, what is going on. So when we have this um, first or default async and the first step is link query translator. This is a very high level overview of the different steps. And then after it will use the database provider to translate that c -sharp code to the appropriate database, which in our case is SQL Server, will translate to this TSQL, very simple one. And then after we're gonna run this query, getting result from database. And then after that, uh, EF core will create some classes, relation fix up in case of any includes. 
and then just simply returning to the color one, right? So if we see these um, steps here, it seems we need to focus more on the database provider. For the SQL server, we are using this NoGet package, Entity Framework Core SQL Server, which is responsible based on your database uh, creating the appropriate uh, command query, actually, the database query. So here, because we are using the SQL server, it will generate this CSQL based on the, the link one, right? But who is responsible for executing this query against our database? Here is the NuGet package, Microsoft.data.sql client, which is a separated NuGet package and also separate the repository for dealing with the SQL server one. So what I'm going to do is I am going to run, um, already run the, the benchmark for this specific uh, SQL client NuGet package. But the question is, how would I know which version of this uh, SQL client package is using in the uh, SQL server uh, package? So I'm going to introduce this very interesting new feature in .NET 9 for .NET NuGet Y. So if I go to my command line here, I am already in the SQL Server Provider project. So simply, if I just type .NET NuGet Y um, Microsoft.data.SQL client, the package that I'm looking for, and then if I run this, we can see in the uh, SQL Server Nugget package, this uh, client, SQL client internally is using, and the version is 5.1.6. So I'm going to run this uh, benchmark for this specific um, version of the SQL client. So let's go back to our presentation. So here is the, the result. And again, surprising. It seems that the number are the same with the EF core for the SQL client for exact same tables, same schema, everything, right? So what we understand here, what it means, it means actually the problem is happening in the SQL client nugget package, not in the, the EF core itself. So we're gonna go more deep in this SQL client. So here is the, the open um, issue in the SQL client repository, which she created uh, around four years ago, that pointing, OK, for large data, asynchronous uh, API is much slower than sync one. So this is a very, very nice thread. Uh, you can go and read all of the comments here, highly recommended. I already learned a lot from the, the comments that uh, community um, replying on this uh, uh, issue. But what I'm going to do here is just going to understand what exactly happening for this school client and then how to fix that. Okay, so as we saw in the previous uh, slide, here, this uh, kind of um, the application side, all the steps happening in the application side are th these uh, steps. And then at some point, we're going to go out of our application and then executing the query for uh, our database and then getting the result, right? So we need to understand what is going on here exactly in this uh, step. So after running the query, SQL Server starts sending back our um, response, chunk by chunk. But here, we need to know what protocol is using for uh, moving and sending these packets. Well, actually, SQL Server is using TDS protocol to uh, exchange the packets, tabular data stream which is specifically for the SQL Server only. So next slide, we're going to just um, see what is going on in this TDS, because this is very important. 
TDS was originally designed and developed by Sybase company. And after that, Microsoft bought it and owned that um, company, which was actually uh, was the creator of the SQL Server. And Microsoft keep using the TDS as a protocol for um, sending and uh, communicating between client and uh, server. The each um, default size for the TDS package is eight kilobyte. So for example, if we have five megabyte of the, the response for sending back to the client, SQL Server has to send around um, 640 TDS message to the client. You can see how much frequently between the um, server and client is happening. This is the TDS message format. So here the server first start will with the uh, sending the column metadata saying that, hey client, I'm gonna send these columns as a data to you, prepare yourself, and then start sending the raw data one by one and uh, until all of the those raw data is done and then send the done data, right? And uh, here each of this raw data is eight kilobyte. It doesn't mean it's whole row, it depends on your row size. Maybe it's five megabytes and then the SQL server has to send lots of uh, this raw data until it's done. So for this reason, everyone that wants to deal with the SQL server, which is here is SQL client, no good package, they need to have a TDS parser, then uh, which is responsible actually for the getting those um, messages, aggregate all of them, parsing them, and then uh, prepare everything for the upper layer and saying that, okay, this row is done and then you can use it, right? So, but this is TDS parser is uh, the actually our critical point because the problem exactly happening in this uh, TDS parser. The way that TDS parser is implemented in the SQL client Nugget package for async API is causing much more memory allocation. And consequently, we're going to have a slower query. So it seems I already put the, um, the GitHub link for in the resources. You, you can go and see the code in the this repository. Very interesting to uh, review the code. Uh, but here, when we have, it seems when for each of those uh, packets, TDS uh, packets that is uh, coming to the uh, the application part, they are resetting the the copy of data because the sync one it needs to wait and then getting all the uh, data. But async is actually using those kind of uh, task cancellation source, waiting, uh, checking if there is more packages. So every time they are actually resetting the uh, like uh, array of binary, copy this binary to this one, this array to this one. So it causes much more memory allocation. And guess what? When we have this kind of copy paste, who is come to the picture? Garbage collection. It needs to run very frequently and causes maybe at runtime to have a slower query, right? So this is the, the main issue in the SQL client. And after that, we're gonna check what we can do about it. As we know that the issue is already open, it means it's not fixed um, totally. And then here, I'm not gonna just fix that problem, but because the in the the thread as well they mentioned it taking years to uh, fix that. But we are just going to improve uh, our code by doing some tricks, right? Okay, so the first one, the simple one actually, is using sync over async method. When we say okay. Um, 
sync method is 50 times faster than async, why not just using sync? But as we know, we need to be careful about using sync uh, APIs, making your application not scalable, actually. And um, so if we have very specific table, one table, for example, two table in our uh, database that we know it's going to uh, take in more data and uh, has a NVRCAR max with lots of uh, megabytes. So we're going to put some comments. OK, I am going to use this sync method because of this issue, right? Perfect. Another one, if you are using the SQL client directly, we can actually change the command behavior and then set it to the um, sequential access. What sequential access does here is actually streaming the data as they come from the SQL server. Instead of waiting for getting entire uh, row and loading entire row, row into the memory, and which is the default behavior actually, it will stream the data as they come to the upper layer, and then it causes much less uh, memory allocation and then better performance. We cannot use the uh, sequential access in EF core because by default is using the, the entity framework when trying to uh, run the query using the default behavior, but is already in process for a long time, and you can check the GitHub issue as well. Another one is updating the SQL package to the latest version and suppressing the internal one. I already asked this question in the um, EF core repository because here, uh, currently in the SQL server EF core 9, we are using 5.16 uh, as the version for SQL client, but it's not the latest one. The latest one is a uh, five two two. So the the reason that they are using the five um, point one point six is that is the LTS version for the SQL uh, client because of this kind of issues that every time EF core release that um, EF that SQL client obsolete or has some problem. So they are frequently needs to uh, release another EF core version. So they decided to just using the um, uh, the latest, uh, uh, the LTS version, sorry. So, but here we can use this uh, EF, um, uh, the updated version, because we know that the 5.2.2 uh, version has a significant, a significant uh, improvement for the specific issues that we are talking about. I already put the uh, the URL uh, for this pull request. You can go and check the code. Very interesting. Uh, they made a very good uh, improvement on this issue. So after that, if we just run the nugget y again, we can see the internal package using the latest one. We're going to run the, the benchmark and seeing the result after applying these changes. And as a last one, we know that um, the default package here, uh, the default packet size for the TDS is 8 kilobytes. So very simple uh, question is, why not just increasing the packet size, which is a good one. We can increase the packet size and telling a school server to sending a bigger packets to just uh, preventing lots of frequency for sending the TDS packets. The maximum allowed value is 32 kilobytes. So when we are um, trying to use the connection string, we can just saying that packet size, this the bytes for um, as a packet size, and this is the maximum value. If you set it more, you will get exception that you're not allowed to uh, set more than 32 kilobyte. And um, if we want to run the benchmark based on these uh, um, su suggested uh, solutions, 
I'm not gonna go to the benchmark code. This is the, the, the same code, but just doing these tricks. So here is the last um, benchmark that we did for the SQL server with these numbers. And by only updating SQL client 5 to 2, we are getting around nine times faster in case of performance, which doesn't matter that one, that you know, that much. But very importantly, the allocation part. You can see how much is different for the allocation part. If you check the pull request for the SQL client, it is not that much changes or refactoring the code, but it's just simply you need to understand the way that the TDS package coming to your application and then trying to make it effective for uh, aggregating the packages. And in case of using the latest school client and also uh, increasing the packet size, we're gonna get 17 faster uh, as a, a, the result. The allocated part is the same because still we are getting the same amount of the data from database, but the performance is better. Depends on your scenario, which um, case is matter for you. If you're caring about the speed, you can go for this solution. So here we understand what is the issue with the large data set in EF core, where is it and how to fix it partially. Keep an eye, uh, eye on, the, on the, the GitHub issue, update your packages as they release and care about the internal packages as well. Not only as we saw, okay, this is EF core, but internally is using the older uh, LTS version for the SQL client. Always set the max um, value, uh, max len for the string property, if possible. I would suggest to set a global max len for all the strings in your all tables or entities. It is possible by using the convention in the DB context. Um, you can just say that for all the strings, for example, put 200, 500 as a max len. Uh, if I for, or forget, for uh, for example, setting constraint on a string, it will take the default one and global constraint. So another point here is if you have an var uh, or van binary max in your database, then it could be a security issue as well. For example, I have a description for the the user profile for my user. For example, I log in and putting. 100 megabyte text in my description uh, form and then save it, right? You don't know because you already set the NVACAR max in your table. And then after, if I just call in my user profile, for sure your um, backend will get out of memory exception and will be crashed, right? As a last point here, EF core is just an ORM. Cannot do magic for you you have to understand and learning about underlying database based on your situation, which database you are using. With EF Core, you have to uh, go and learn that in this kind of tricks and understand the issues following the uh, community and the GitHub uh, issues. So that's it for me. This is the uh, resources that I mentioned during the presentation. And thank you so much.